Well, friends, while Liz continues to fight for her life up here, we're going <laughs> to begin our scripture reading. Our uh, reading tonight is from the Gospel of Luke, and uh, Scott's going to read it here for us in a second. You're going to hear two main stories tonight. You're going to hear the story of the birth of Jesus Christ and the first people that were told that Jesus was born, and it's kind of a strange choice that God makes. So check out this story here from Luke. Thank you, Alex. This evening from the Gospel of Luke. This is uh, where we get uh, Linus's. Never mind, I'm sorry. Charlie Brown Christmas. Anyway, you've probably heard this before. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. I'll give you a chance to find this in your Bible or your Bible app on your smartphone. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that same region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord." This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. Thank you so much, Scott. Friends, will you pray with me? Lord, we come before you here this evening to learn about this story we know so well. This story that you came to make your home among us. So God, open your word in a fresh way to us here tonight that we may see with fresh eyes this story that we know so well. God, teach us here in this place. This is your house on your night. And we trust you. So God, move in this place. Let us hear what you would have to hear us tonight. Lord, we love you and we trust you. Amen. So I remember when I was a kid growing up, I used to watch all these Christmas movies. And in almost every commercial or movie, Christmas morning would come. And you'd see all the kids and family come running down the stairs. And they'd run to all the presents. And they'd rip them all open. And paper would just fly everywhere. And they'd all get their presents. And everything was amazing. And there were toys. And Everybody was so excited, and it was just kind of this big chaotic moment. And I thought, man, that is not what Christmas looks like at our house. (laughs) Now, my parents are here tonight. They surprised me tonight, so I'm sure that they will tell you a very different version of this story. But let me tell you, my six-year-old recollection is by far the truest. So (laughs) So this is how Christmas went down when I was a child in the Williams household. Somewhere around 4 a.m., I would wake up because I was just shaking all night waiting for Santa Claus. I'd wake up, and I would look at the clock, and I would say, it says a.m., that's morning, let's go. So I'd run in there, and I'd knock on my parents' door, and I'd hear this like, ugh, hello, what? I would say, it's Christmas. I would hear my dad go, no, it's not. Go back to bed. 
So I'd like sulk off back to bed, and I'd kind of lay there and just kind of look around, and okay, okay, look at the clock, okay, it's 4.32, okay, probably not yet, okay, okay, it's 4.33, okay, probably not yet. And I'd sit there and wait until about 5 a.m., and I'd run in there and knock on the door, what? It's Christmas! No, it's not. Ugh. So I'd run, go back to bed and lay there, okay, 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 about 5.30, I go back and do the same thing, not yet, okay, so I go back to bed. And I would repeat this on and on and on until probably around 8 a.m. My parents would finally get up, and they would say, okay, it's Christmas now. And I was like, yes, time for toys, let's go. And they were like, no, we have to have coffee first. And I was like, come on. (laughs) How do you need coffee? Santa's here. We got to go. Go back to your room. We'll tell you when it's ready. And I'm like, I know it's ready. Santa came last night, all right? Went back to my room, and then there was this protocol where we had to wait until the cameras were ready, everyone was in place. We had to sit behind my sister and I in prison, right? It's just me and my sister. (laughs) Sit back behind the hallway and just wait, and finally we could come out, and we would race out there, and we'd see what Santa brought us, and oh, man, it was amazing. And then we sat down. We all got in a nice little circle, usually my grandfather, but someone would, like, play Santa and hand out a gift to everybody from someone, and Then we would, one at a time, open the gift. What did you get? Oh, who's it from? Oh, from Aunt Mary. How sweet. Oh, make sure and show everybody. Oh, oh, that's so nice. Oh, okay. All right. Now, Kelly, now you go. And one at a time, we would painstakingly go around the circle. (laughs) And if they ever caught me, like, I'd try to, like, be peeking into the next gift, right? Like, you catch, like, a bow to the head. (laughs) Not yet. Because we had to see what everybody got. And I was just, like, watching the movies growing up, like, I was sold a lie. Christmas is supposed to be about chaos and ripping into your toys. The one really fun thing that we always said on Christmas morning is that um, we would always get a big trash can, and we'd throw all the paper in it. We'd, like, wad it up into a ball and, like, play basketball. And my dad and I used to love to throw it across the room. And somehow, I don't know, it always ended up kind of next to my sister. And sometimes the paper would hit her in the face. I don't know. It was an accident every time. I don't know how it happened. But every year it got closer and closer and closer to her. I don't know what to tell you, but... Christmas morning was so full of excitement and love, and I had this anxiety waiting. Well, something weird happened when I turned about 15 or 16 years old. Um, I developed a really, really chronic condition um, called, I want to sleep until noon. (laughs) It's it's pretty common um, amongst teenagers. It's something like one million in one million, get it, every year. Um, And so I wanted to sleep in on Christmas morning, and I thought, They'll love this. My parents have always wanted me to stay in. It'll be great. So about 4.30 in the morning, I hear on my bedroom door, bam, 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 wake up, it's Christmas. And it's my dad at the door. No, dad, it's not Christmas yet. Okay. They come back at 5 o'clock, bam, 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 bam. And I said, what are you doing to me? And he's like, you did it to me. I'm doing it to you. So that was Christmas in our home growing up and still today. Thankfully, we no longer reside in the same home as my parents, so we are saved from that particular brand of early morning torture, but now we have a newborn child, so I'm sure it will resume like clockwork in a couple years, so thank God Henry can't get past the doors yet, so he's (laughs) still locked in his room. (coughs) Pardon me. That feeling of anticipation that we get, especially as children, but never really goes away, that excitement, that joy, that waiting to go out and see what Santa has brought, what Christmas morning will bring, that anticipation, that feeling, that's what we've been talking about for the last month during the season of Advent, building up to this night here where the good news is shared. And here, as Scott read the story, we hear the angels breaking through that silence, breaking through that anticipation and telling the shepherds, the Savior has been born tonight. They share that good news with us. And it's time to celebrate for Christmas has come. Over the past few weeks, we've been studying kind of the <coughs> pardon me kind of the realness of this family we see mary and joseph and jesus so often in these beautiful nativity scenes and everything is so perfect and calm and quiet and it's very well lit and everyone's got makeup on and everyone looks so peaceful and calm but you know childbirth is not peaceful and calm silent night if you've ever been through childbirth would know that is not the appropriate phrase to describe what happens And beside that, they're out in a stable. Now we see, oh, it's a manger, and that sounds beautiful because we sing, away in a manger, and it just sounds so beautiful. 
But it, it was a horse trough, right? I mean, it's like it's where the pigs and the horse ate out of. It was disgusting. It was gross. It would have been loud. It would have been stinky. And here's where Christ is born. Out in the midst of this dirty, smelly, stinky, messy world. And we've been talking about that. How these were real people who lived real lives in this very real way. I was having dinner a week ago with some of our church family members. And after dinner, we got to talking about life and faith in the church. And one of them turned to us and said, you know, I really love that at Crossway, like our faith and our church are kind of messy. I said, what do you mean? Like, I don't know, it's just kind of messy. It's just real people. And I think it should be because life is messy. And I thought, man, that just sounds like the Christmas story. It was messy. And we've cleaned it up a lot for these beautiful nativity scenes, but it was real, and it was messy, and it was complicated. And I love that because that's what our lives are. Our lives are real and messy and complicated, and God comes in in the midst of all of that. It just sounds like Christmas. We see Christ come into this crazy situation, and the craziest part about reading this story in Luke There's 20 verses here that we read tonight, and only one was about the birth of Christ. Did you notice that? There's like six verses of lead up where they're walking to Bethlehem, and there's no room for them, and they're getting there, and then Mary has the baby. One verse, and then it jumps over to some shepherds out in the field, right? What the heck is happening? Like, we've been waiting. We've been reading the whole Bible waiting for this, and here's the final moment, right? Like, the Bible is never short on words, and we get one verse for the birth of Christ. I'm just like, Am I missing a page? What's happening here? And then why are we talking about these shepherds out in the field, right? They got the night shift, like these nobody dudes out in the middle of the field. Like, what do they have to do with anything? Go back to Jesus. I want to hear more about that. (coughs) And so we hear this crazy story. And the angels show up to these shepherds in the middle of the night, and they say, I bring to you good news of great joy. Good news. That's where we get from the word gospel. The gospel... The word gospel literally means good news, and they're bringing this good news, and we've talked about this good news that the angels brought to Mary and Joseph. We talked about those at the beginning of Advent, and how at the time, it may not have felt like good news to Mary and Joseph, because it was complicated. They weren't married yet. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of negativity surrounding what it meant to be an unwed pregnant mother in that time, so this wouldn't have felt like good news. And I can just imagine, what makes this such good news? When the angels show up to the shepherds, why do they say it's good news of great joy? What does that mean for us? This baby was born, but so what? Why is it such good news? One of the things I think makes it such good news comes from the word that the Gospel of Matthew uses to describe Jesus. In Matthew, um, Christ is called Emmanuel, which is when we sing that song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. That's what it means. God is with us. And it might not sound like such a big deal, but if you think about it, from the time we are born until the time we die and everything in between, we really need one main thing. Because jobs come and go, good times come and go, things change, our lives go up and down, but the one thing we always need is to have loved ones with us. From the very beginning to the very end, what matters is that we have loved ones in our lives that are there with us, friends, coworkers, family. We are made to be in community. We are made to love, to be together. And so God embodies that by coming to be with us. Emma posted a video about our son uh, a week ago, and Henry can crawl now, uh, which is just a new level of nightmare in our home as we just chase him around everywhere. Um, he's really into light sockets. I don't know why. Um, Anyway, survival of the fittest would not have been great for little Henry, but anyhow, uh, Henry just crawls around, and we've just got this, like, sea of toys in our living room, just everywhere. People give us toys. We got them from baby showers, just stuff everywhere. But, you know, babies get bored with stuff, so Emma was looking for something new to entertain him, and we just made cookies the day before, and so she got this big, giant metal mixing bowl and threw it out in the middle with this, like, plastic wooden, or this, like, a plastic mixing spoon, put it in the bowl. And Henry crawls over to it, and so she takes this video, and Henry's crawling over to the bowl and picking it up and, like, smashing it on the floor and just, like, laughing gleefully as he's looking back <coughs> at Emma, who's capturing all this. And the caption of the video says, there is no toy that can beat random stuff from the kitchen. 
And I just heard someone tonight, they were like, is Henry excited for Santa? And I'm like, I don't know, he's nine months old. Probably not, but, you know, maybe, I don't know what he understands from us. And they were like, well, you know, he's just going to want the box. And I was like, we've learned this, right? Like, it's just random junk. Like, we'll get all kinds of these beautiful toys for him, and he wants the box. He wants the colander from the kitchen, right? Like, he wants the steak knife that somehow he found. I mean, like, just, (laughs) he wants the random stuff. (coughs) But what Henry really wants is for us to see him doing these things. He'll throw, well, throw is a generous term, but he'll throw a ball, and then he'll look at us, right? Because he wants us to see. And so we clap, yay! Because he wants to see us. And we could give him all the toys in the world, but it's not the toys that he cares about. He wants to show us. He wants to see us. It's the presence. It's being there that matters. No toy could ever suffice for that presence, God shows up. That's what we celebrate here tonight. That need that we have from birth to death is for someone to be with us, to love us, to draw near to us. And that's the very name given to God. Emmanuel, God is with us. God came to be with us so that we are not alone. We are never alone. And the craziest thing is that the first person, the first people that are told that Christ is born, it's not the king it's not the chief priests or the religious leaders. Like, we would think, this is the, this is the son of God. Surely we're going to tell really important people. When the king, you know, when a, when a new royal family member has a birthday, right? It's not like they don't call us, right? No. They tell the press. They tell the royal family. They tell the high of the high. But here, these angels show up to these shepherds. And not only that, like, the ones working the night shift, all right? Shepherds were the lowest rung of society at the time. They were the lowest rung of society, the very bottom. And even below that were the night shift shepherds, all right? These were just, they were the night shift fellas, all right? But these are the ones the angels show up to. And they show up and they say, to you is born a savior. And I've got to wonder every time I read this, why? Why are these the first people that get told that the son of God is born? And the reason I think that the shepherds are the first one to know is the same reason I think that God chose to show up to ask to bear the Son of God, an unwed teenage mother, the wrong person in the wrong place. It's the same reason I think that God chose Noah, this nobody bum drunk, to save the world from the flood. It's the same reason he chose Moses to free the people from Egypt who was on the run himself for murder. It's the same reason he chose Saul to spread the gospel, to bring all these new churches to life and to write most of the New Testament. Saul was murdering Christians. That was his whole job, was to hunt them down and kill them. And he meets Christ and becomes Paul. God has a habit all throughout time of picking the most unlikely, the most unqualified, the lowest of the low to change the world. And the reason I think that's true is because God doesn't need us. God wants us to participate. And God wants us to know that this good news is for everyone. It's not just for those at the top of the class. They do okay in society already. God says, I came for the low. I came for those who feel lost, for those who feel alone, and everybody in between. And so God, the Son of God, is born out back in a smelly horse trough to nobody parents from a nobody town, unwed, in shame, and the first people they tell is these lowly night shift shepherds because God came for all of us, and constantly we see God continuing to play this out. All of this matters for us because there will come a time in your life, you probably have already experienced it, and some of you are there right now, but there'll come a time in all of our lives where we feel lost and alone and we are overwhelmed by grief and sadness and heartache and we feel like nobody understands what's happening and people will say, I know what you're going through and you won't believe them. You'll say, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what it's like. This pain hurts. Nobody knows. I'm lost and I'm alone. The reason Emmanuel matters, the reason God with us matters, the reason Christmas Eve matters here tonight is because God understands. God came and lived our life. God knows what it's like to be human. God came and was born as a helpless baby and lived a fully human life and experienced all the things that we go through. God knows what it's like to make friends. Christ had these friends that he grew up with and laughed and loved and Christ knows what it's like to be made fun of, right? Because there's no way you make it through middle school without being picked on. There's just no way, even if you're the son of God. Oh, carpenter, huh? Mm. 
what a great future you're going to have. I mean, like, they got to make jokes against him. He knows what it's like to be picked on. He had to have. He knows what it's like to have a friend betray him. Judas was one of his closest friends, and he betrayed him even to death. Christ knows what it's like to feel betrayed by God. Jesus calls out at the end of his life, God, why have you forsaken me? Because he feels alone. Even though he knows God hasn't left him, he feels abandoned and he feels alone. He knows what it's like to love, to feel loss, to be tortured, and to suffer. Christ knows what all those things are like because he lived them and is here for us today. That's why this good news matters. That's why it's good news of great joy. One of my closest friends uh, just suffered a horrible loss. He lost both of his grandparents um, in a murder-suicide last week. And I was preparing to go visit. We were already planning to go down um, to Houston to see some friends. And it's where he lives. And uh, I found out the funeral was this last Friday. And I didn't know what to tell him. And I felt like it was my job, right? Because I'm the pastor of our friend group. And everyone was looking to me. And I was like, uh, because what do you say? I mean, what do you say? They were older, no, because it still hurts. What do you say? And I felt like such a failure. I had nothing to say to comfort him. I didn't know what to do. And I remembered this story. I was preparing the sermon for tonight, and I was reading this story, and, and I remember hearing that God is with us, and that's the good news. So I called him up, and I said, buddy, I feel like I let you down. I don't know what to tell you. I have, I have no answers. I don't... I can't tell you why. I've, I've got nothing to say that will probably cheer you up, but can I come to the funeral with you? It's the only thing I know how to do. I, I just be there. And this is a, a friend of mine who does not ask for help ever. And so I assumed he would be like, no, 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 don't worry about it. But he said, you know, I mean, you don't have to, but it'd be cool if you came. And I was like, oh, man, that's as close to, you know, a yes as I'm ever going to get. So I said, man, okay, I'll show up. And as I'm there, <laughs> his Parents always kept introducing me as, this is Alex, uh, our, our son's pastor friend. And I'm like, oh, great. Put me on the spot here. Like, now everybody's looking to me to, like, I was like, I don't want to say the prayer before dinner or something. Like, I don't, don't put me on that spot. So I was just there. And it was hard. But there was incredible love because the family all came together. And there was a powerfulness in that. There was forgiveness. There was peace. There was love and hope, even in the midst of this horrible tragedy. And I thought, you know what? This is what we celebrate. This is what matters, that we show up. Because that's what God did. God is with us. And so we are never alone. That's what we celebrate here tonight. God is with us. And so we are never alone. And friends, that is surely good news of great joy for all the people. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you tonight seeking your peace. God, this is such a fun day to sing these songs, to light these candles, to hear these stories we know. But God, it's so easy to wake up and celebrate the new year and move on, and it doesn't seem to have a lot of lasting effect for us. Christmas comes and Christmas goes, and we're on to the next season. But God, we are reminded here tonight why this matters. We are reminded that this matters because tragedy comes for everyone. And God, we know that you don't send tragedies. You don't cause these horrible heartaches. But even in the midst of them, you're there. And that's what tonight's all about. That you came to be with us. To sacrifice everything to come be with us. That is a gift we could never repay. And so God, tonight we simply say thank you and celebrate and go tell as many people as we can that Jesus Christ is born. Lord, we love you so much and we always pray in your Holy Son's name who taught us to pray as we say together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be. As it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power. (coughs) Amen.